education. And we worked on this webinar with the Citizen Lake Monitoring Program, Water Action Volunteers, um, Wisconsin DNR, and the First Detector Network. Whoa. Sorry, my slides are stuck. Uh, just an overview of what we're all going to cover during this webinar. Um, just a pretty quick introduction um, to welcome you all. And then we're going to go over the different species groups we'll have. And each presentation will be 20 to 25 minutes. Um, we're going to first cover submerged aquatic plants and then go over the aquatic and wetland animals that we should keep a lookout for. Uh, riparian plants and upland wetland plants that you might see when you're um, along lake streams or wetlands. And then we'll have a, a question and answer period. So the species that we're gonna review are all species that are identified, almost all of the species that are identified in um, NR40 chapter. NR40 is our invasive species identification, classification, and control rule. So this is species that we've identified as issues when the, within the state we've um, said that they're invasive and we want to be able to keep a lookout for them. So we selected target species from within NR40 that we'll see when we're out in lake streams or wetlands. Um, so you can go to our NR40 website to learn more about the species that we identified and regulate. For each of the species that we're going to cover, we're going to go over just key identification characteristics. So certain things about each species that you need to look at to be confident in your ID for them. And then we'll talk about um, just the different parts of these plants or animals. Then we're gonna all share phenology information that was put together the, by the Wisconsin First Detector Network. And you'll see in these slides, we'll have the list of the species and just to show you the symbology so each presenter doesn't have to go through it. Um, there's going to be different colors for the life stage that you'll see at the time of year. Um, we'll also have symbology for detectability. If it's a hollow circle, it's not detectable during that time of year. If you only see a quarter circle, it's low, half is medium and full is high. Um, and like I said, that can be found at the First Detector Network and we'll provide that uh, a link to where you can see more information later in the PowerPoint. We'll also share distribution maps for each species and there'll be small uh, screen clips of this map that you see in the state of Wisconsin. For the most part, we're pulling our maps from the lakes and AIS mapping tool that's available on the DNR website. And it's tied to all the data that we have in the surface water integrated monitoring system, which is where we put, enter all of our data for monitoring efforts for aquatic invasive species. Um, where you see the green check, it means it's a verified urease water mole foil. And then some of these are, are just lines if it's along a section of stream where it's found. And, um, if we have a, a hash mark, that's going to be a polygon. Um, so they're, they're not all going to be big like this with the big check marks. They'll be a little harder to see. You can see this Vila Sonida County. Um, so not all the maps are going to be totally visible in the PowerPoint, um, but you'll be able to access them through our mapping tool. Um, so I gave the intro on Maureen Ferry, the Aquatic Invasive Species Monitoring Lead for the DNR. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about the riparian invasive plants that we'd like you to keep an eye out for. And I have, I think, nine species here to go over. I list them here. Um, the first I'm gonna talk about is purple loosestrife, which is widely established in the state of Wisconsin. You can see the map in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, purple loosestrife grows to be anywhere between three and seven feet tall. It has a square semi-woody stem um, and uh, with opposite leaves, you can see this picture, drawing picture in the, in the upper right corner. Um, and it has five to seven petals on the flowers. You can count the petals on the flowers and no petiole. So that means these flowers grow directly off the stalk of the plant. It's not going to be bushy um, like some of the native lookalikes. I'll show you on, on the next screen. So it, it makes it very distinct that you'll see this tight spike of bright purple, almost magenta flowers, typically growing along road ditches. Um, these are the common lookalikes, fireweed, which looks very similar with the flowering stalk, except these 
flowers do have a pedicel, so they're gonna look bushier. Um, there's gay feather, which doesn't have those opposite leaves, and then blue vervain, which is gonna be multiple little spikes um, growing off the, the top of the plant. Then there's yellow iris, which has these beautiful showy yellow flowers that are about three to four inches wide, and they only have three, three petals. It's a popular garden plant that sometimes escapes. Um, they have broad sword-like shaped leaves um, that make it pretty distinct, but a lot of things look like that that I'll show you on the next slide. They grow really upright and stiff. Um, and they grow to be about three to four feet tall. These are also widely as distributed as you can see in the map on the lower left corner. Um, and they're easily mistaken for other things if they don't have those really distinct yellow flowers. Like the blue flag iris, um, so they have a blue or purplish colored flower, but the same sword-like leaves. Um, cattail will also, when they're not flowering, or have those spikelets, those brown spikelets, um, those leaves are pretty similar too, just not always as wide. And sweet flag that you see on the far far right, um, but they are not going to have those bright yellow flowers, but um, you can easily mistake it with just those sword-like leaves. The next plant is flowering rush, which is from Africa and Eurasia. Uh, it's a really cool plant. It has these three pink flowers that are in umbels. They have three petals and three sepals on each one of the flowers within that umbel um, that are just so distinct. There's nothing else that looks like the flowering rush when it's in flower. And it also has a, not a square stem, but a triangular stem. So with three sides to it. Um, it's fairly common in the state, but not everywhere as you can see on the map on the far left. Um, things that it could be mistaken for if you don't have those pink, really distinct flowers. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm ahead of myself. Um, the stems are actually unique too, if you know what to look for. So the stem, stem is gonna be spongy and it has a cup-shaped base. It's easier to show with my hands, but you can't see me in person. Um, these stems each come down together. They're parallel so to form in this cup. And then within these roots, you will find these small bulbs and other plants won't have that. Um, it's really going to be easiest for the casual observer to see it when you have the flowering stalk. And I th think that I have flowering rush included in the um, phenology chart at the end of my PowerPoint so you know when it flowers. So a look-alike is going to be burr reeds. Burr reeds also have this triangular stem so it's going to look identical to flowering rush if you don't have the flowers. Burr reach does have so it's Sparganium species, has these little like bulbs of spiky looking flowers. Um, you will see those um, more commonly than you would see like those pink flowers. So you have to keep an eye out during that right time of year. Java water dropwort is probably a species you haven't heard a lot about, um, Enothea Havonica. Um, it's also called Vietnamese parsley, Japanese parsley, Chinese celery, or water celery. It's a creeping perennial, so it becomes a big issue when it's along streams. This is a stream in southern Wisconsin. Sue Graham took a picture, took this picture. She's the uh, lake coordinator in southern Wisconsin. Um, so she also works with like citizens and lake groups um, that come in for grants and she helps them apply for grants and get these species removed. Um, Java water dropwort looks like a parsley. It looks like flat parsley. So parsley like what you'd buy at the store. Um, this grows about four to 12 inches long and three to eight inches wide to give you some kind of a size reference. It's mostly gonna be in this just solid green color, but there is a cultivar that they call a flamingo cultivar, which you see on the right that has these white edges, white to pink edges that um, look a lot like Bishop's goutweed, um, which are one of the lookalikes I'll share. Um, it has an umbel of tiny white flowers, so similar to how that purple uh, flowering rush has the umbel of the pink flowers. This has just has small little white flowers growing off the, the stalk, um, the side of this hollow jointed stem. Um, this is a plus 
press plant from that same population that Sue Graham had photographed in that previous population. To me, the press plant looks a little bit like uh, cilantro or parsley, um, if you were to, to flatten it out for what the leaves look like. And there's only a few different populations in the state of Wisconsin, the one in South Central and then two in Southeast. Um, and here's just some pictures of the lookalikes and anything in the carrot family, and I think that Anna is going to go through a couple of these species, um, are going to be tricky if you don't have the trained eye. That's why taking a photograph or getting specimens are going to, are going to help a lot and checking with somebody, somebody else. Um, but you'll see they all have that jointed type of stem and then similar leaf structure where it looks a little bit like parsley or cilantro. Um, and here's a picture of the bishop gout weed that had the agapodium that has the white edges that I said that one uh, cultivar looks like. And there's also natives that this looks like, which are Chinese hemlock and sweet Sicily, which is more of an upland plant. Oh, just to show you distribution, even through the United States, it's not terribly common. We have those three locations in the state of Wisconsin. There's not a ton even in the United States. Um, but it's a little trickier to identify, so it's good just to keep an eye out so we can get on it um, sooner. Reed managrass is the next species. Probably you guys know it more by its Latin name, Glyceria. Um, it's a rhizomatous plant similar to the Java water dropwort. Um, so it, its roots grow through the sediments and that's how it can spread too. Um, its inflorescence is an open panicle, so you see the the stalk of the grass will grow up and then you've got the panicle of the little flowers on the top of the grass. Um, this genus, the Glyceria genus in general, has angular bend in the leaf and then a detached ligule. So the angular bend that you're going to look like is look at is very characteristic. You see the bend here actually even has a lighter color where this creates a pretty distinct curve and then you see this white color. Um, if you see that it's it's going to be glyceria and we'll talk about how what else to look for um, and glyceria is a lot of grasses even have this um, ligule that you can even peel back this part of the leaf and this ligule is free it's not attached. Um, this genus also has closed sheaths. So you can see how there's this papery part of the grass that you can kind of peel this part away from the main steam stem. Um, and then it grows together here. You see that the stop, it stops here and then it's a closed sheath, everything to the right. Um, so this just comes together. It doesn't go all the way to the base of the stem. So the Glyceria maxima, um, the genus is pretty distinct in that the upper gloom has one vein and the parallel veins on the lemma um, are here too, but it's very easy to see when you know what to look for. So the glooms are gonna be like the bottom, you could say scale or leaf structure that's on the flowering part. So like this is the bottom leaf or bract we could call it for the gloom um, and this is the whole flower of just this one part but this bottom uh, well the upper gloom <laughs> has just this one vein that you can see it's just this brighter red color and then the pair there's parallel veins on the lemma so down here you can see this is that paler gloom you can't totally see the one vein and right above this are the pale pale <laughs> The lemma with the parallel veins. Up here you can see the parallel veins on this lemma. This is a great picture that was taken by Chris Knoll. He's one of our wetland biologists. Ah, so the native lookalike for Glyceria maxima is Glyceria grandis. So it's the same genus, but a different species. Um, they're gonna differ in the leaf blade width, but there's this overlap. It's eight to 18 millimeters and six to 12. It doesn't help you a lot if like, they're both measuring eight millimeters. So you wanna look at the leaf sheath edge texture and then the gloom length. So the leaf sheath edge that's gonna be here on Glyceria maxima is gonna feel scabrous. So a little bit rough to it. The grandis is gonna feel smooth. 
the upper gloom length of the maxima is double what it is of the grandest. So it's gonna just be bigger and hardier to go back a slide. So the glue, that would be this little leaf or bract that you're looking at is gonna be bigger on the invasive one than it is on the native one. Um, also worth mentioning is that when you have these species side by side, the maxima looks far more hardy. There's gonna be more branches coming off of it um, than what you see on the grandest, which is fairly subjective, but when you see them side by side, it's fairly apparent. And then I have a series of photos because I thought they were great. These photos were taken by Jason Granberg, which is one of the uh, invasive plant guys in um, NHC. Um, these lighter colored flowers of the Glyceria, this is all Glyceria maxima that goes down the stream outlet. So this is earlier in the season because the flowers are still very um, much still opening. Um, this is it in the off season. So either probably late fall is my guess, but this is how dense it's going to get. Um, everything that you see in this picture is going to be Glyceria maxima. This is also Glyceria maxima. Basically all the grass that you see all around these trees and along the water, that is Glyceria maxima. Um, you can see in this drainage ditch, this is all Glyceria maxima to going to under the highway. Um, this is a field of Glyceria maxima. And this is its distribution. It's not very widely established um, outside of Wisconsin, although we see a little bit in the Eastern Great Lakes state, not a ton. Um, we mainly have it in Southeast Wisconsin, a little bit in North Central Wisconsin. And then we have uh, these couple of populations in Price County. And then I think it's Northern Oneida County um, here. Um, and very likely that it's far more widely distributed. It's just a grass that not a lot of people look at, so it's under documented. So we want people to, to let us know if they see it. Next, I'm gonna go into some cattails. Um, in general, the native cattails have a continuous male and female flowers. On the top here are the male parts on the bottom are the pistillate spikes. So these are the female flowers. Uh, so the native are fairly contiguous. The non-native you have this gap, a separation between the male and female flowers. Um, that's what we've always learned by, but in recent years a geneticist at the University of Illinois has told us that is not always true because these things hybridize a lot so that confuses us when we're out in the field where we're seeing this gap but sometimes that gap's not always true and then um, it turns out that it's actually is indeed the non-native um, sometimes when you still have no gap but generally we still hold that as true if we see a population that's now expanding it's becoming incredibly dense and nothing else can grow there um, we can send it for genetic testing um, to get a confirmation on what indeed it is the first cattail I'll talk about is narrow leaf cattail, typha and gustifolia. Um, the leaves are four to 10 millimeters wide, um, which, and they grow taller than what the flower spike is. So the flower spike ends here, but the leaves continue off the picture. Um, the stems in general are one to three meters tall. Um, the flowers, the male and female portions have are separated by that two to four inch gap. But like I said, there are two to four centimeter gap. Um, there's gonna be variation when we see hybrids and we see hybrids a lot. Um, the spike is less than six inches though. And that can be a pretty sure thing and maybe helpful in identifying between the species. And then I just use um, the map from the herbarium website because we don't always inventory all the typha and gustafolia because it's so widespread in the state, similar to reed canary grass. Um, for Typha ex glauca, so the hybrid cattail, um, the leaves are going to be variable um, between the broad leaf and the narrow leaf in width um, because you've got two different cattails that are hybridizing with different amounts of width. So they're going to be somewhere in between and it's not always going to be a very reliable characteristic. <clears throat> the stems do grow to be two to three meters tall. You're going to see that with a lot of the cattails. 
Um, the male and female are separated by a two to four centimeter gap, similar to um, the narrow leaf cattail. Uh, and the spike is greater than six inches tall, so they'll be a little bit taller for this, um, this flower spike, the pistillate flower spike. And then we have a less common cattail. The first two I went, went over, um, we don't inventory fully regularly because they're so established, but graceful cattail, we have very few populations in the state and we really appreciate if folks can keep a lookout for them. They grow up to three to five feet tall. They're often overgrown by surrounding vegetation, so they could be easily missed. They have yellowish flower, let yellowish male flowers at the top and greenish female flowers at the bottom, um, up to two inches below the males. So there's just a two inch gap essentially is what we're saying. Um, and this flower spike looks more compact. The picture on the left is really gonna be the best way that you're gonna see this. You can see Zach's hand. It's just a regular guy's hand. Those flowers are, the spike is tiny, like it's not very big. The plant overall, like it's very thin um, and inconspicuous, like I said. So imagine the size of his hand, but on each of these little flower spikes, like they're not very large and you can see where they will be missed if all the other vegetation, bulrushes, phragmites even um, grow up around that, it could be easily missed. <clears throat> um, and this is where we know it to be in Wisconsin. I think it's just four populations all in southeast Wisconsin. Most of them are um, either restoration, so one of them's at a, 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 a clover leaf along a interchange on a highway. Um, some are going to be in like private ponds or restoration areas. Um, so they're not widely established and we're just trying to figure out what's the best way to be able to monitor these and to see them um, given that they can be hidden by other vegetation. <clears throat> oh, and then we have southern cattail. Um, this one's a little bit more distinct. Uh, southern cattail are different in color, which we don't always rely on color because that can be subjective, but they're gonna have very pale yellow green leaves, um, less than five eighths of an inch wide. So a little more narrow. Um, they're best distinguished in all seasons by a small brown glands on the inner leaf sheath, about one to 10 centimeters from the base. So what that means is this is what the leaf on the picture on the right, this is a picture from Galen Smith, who used to be the Typha expert at UW-Madison. Um, this leaf, when you look at these tall leaves of the cattail, you go down to the bottom of the leaf and pull it at the base of the stem, about one to 10 centimeters from the base of this leaf. So you gotta get down into the wetland and pull it up. Um, you'll see these really distinct mucilaginous brown, brown glands, but on the inside. So this is the inside and that's the outside. So and it's a little bit curved when you're facing it. Um, this is your best way to know what it's gonna look like. And other, a couple other cattails will have that, but nothing will be so easily distinguished like with the naked eye to see that. Um, the flowers also look different in color. The male flowers um, at the top have a cinnamon brown color to them. Um, and then the female flowers at the bottom have this really distinct sausage shape. They're really tightly packed together. Um, the, and the gap between these, the male and the female spikes are two and a half to five centimeters. So it can be pretty, pretty big. Um, and they grow somewhat tall, um, five to 13 feet tall. Um, so they'll be more, more noticeable, of course, than the Typha lexmanii, that graceful cattail, the last one I talked to you about. They're bigger and they're gonna be different in color, more of a lime green and cinnamon colored um, spikelets than the other cattails. And we only have a couple populations in Madison, well in Med Middleton technically, um, by Costco and a couple different um, places that go along the stream to Pheasant Branch Creek. Um, they've been seen there for 
I think since 2013. So they've been present for a while. I even driving around yesterday, I went and visited them to see if I could get some better pictures of some of the brown mucilaginous um, bases of the stem. And, and they're still there and, and doing quite well. Um, but like good chance that there's somebody somewhere else in the state. Um, they're probably planted there on purpose as part of a restoration project. So whatever person planted them there, likely planted them other places. We just haven't heard about them yet. Um, my phenology chart doesn't show all the species that I went over, um, but we can work on getting that information to you guys so that you have it. But this is most things you can see during, during the summer, summer months. Um, and we'll have access to this PowerPoint for you guys too. 